ships and, and things that we're going to do as, as the days proceed and go forward uh, and, and of course visitation efforts and uh, right now we're, we're getting our, our footing and our grounding still working on uh, the bank accounts and things like that. that that should be really picking up steam last week was a holiday week so that should be gaining uh, steam and traction uh, this coming week as we move along but uh, good to see you here we're, we're here to worship and uh, I hope you get help from God and we'll certainly be uh, continuing to do the podcast and the uploads and things like that. So let's be prayerful, mindful of it uh, as we go into today's services. Let's open up in a word of prayer and then we're going to have a couple of songs and uh, get right into today's service. Lord, we love you so much. And God, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be back in your house. And among your people, God, and I, I love each one of them and thank you for their faithfulness and uh, their, their attendance to the church and God I pray that you might bless them and God as we proceed forward in the days ahead Bethany Baptist Church I pray that your will be done and the work of God be accomplished and Lord we'll see the gospel go out and missionaries uh, established and sent out throughout our community and the whole world but God I pray Lord in the days ahead that you'll continue to uh, lay the groundwork to get us a, a permanent uh, residence, a permanent meeting place, Lord, for our church, our assembly of people that want to meet together and uh, worship you and love one another and love you. And I pray, God, that you would work that out as we proceed forward. God, for this service, Lord, we commend it in your hands, Lord, as we sing and we fellowship uh, one with another. God, just the good spirit, atmosphere among your people uh, already today. I, I want to say I thank you for it. And God, I pray that you would work in every heart as, as you challenge my heart with this message today. And I pray, God, that you would bless Brother Jerry as he leads to singing. And God, the fellowship one with another for every dollar that's given. May it be given to give you glory and give you honor. And uh, God, I thank you, Lord, for uh, what you've done here and what you're going to do in the days ahead. We commend these things in your hand. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, we ask these things. Amen and amen. All right, brother Jerry. All right, good morning. Let's all stand and we'll sing a little song. Got an opening song last week called This is the Day that the Lord is Made. So let's sing a couple of choruses of that before we get started and the rest of it. Okay? We're going to start out singing with the old rugged cross. You got to make it. And by the way, if you don't mind, when we get through with these songs today, we get through with them today, just put them back on the table back there. This is kind of going to be our song books until we get some get a more permanent place and get us some song books and stuff like that. So we'll have these every week until then. Okay? So we put them back there together, we'll save half the duplicate so many times. Now, this is a song everybody knows is one of the sweetest, most precious songs in the history of the Christian life. The old rugged cross.
I, I, that word clean there, it takes me back about four years when Hillary said they're clinging to their Bibles and they're clinging to their guns. And I say guilty. Amen. Praise God. And uh, that, my, thought, my mind just went to that when we singing that song. But uh, I'm going to cling to the Word of God, cling to the Bible, cling, cling to the, our rights that God gives us. By the way, did you see where uh, the church is in New York? They took it to the Supreme Court and they won this week. To God be the glory. Uh, to God be the glory for that too, praise God. I love this next song, the next couple songs we're going to do. And it's beautiful. The first time I heard this song was many, many years ago, and it's still the message in the ministry of the song that still tells me this how it is the blessed Bible. Amen. Of his name. Yes, it is. Amen. Amen. Amen.
uh, questions from the scriptures uh, in, in this immediate context of John 20. We will uh, look at a few other places in the scriptures as always as supportive. Uh, but I've had this on my heart. I'm looking forward to it today. Do be mindful of podcast, First John. Uh, and I'll be doing these live stream things through the week here and there as the Lord kind of gives me uh, something on my heart to try to encourage you along uh, through the week. And, and I do praise the Lord. I've already made mention of it. I do praise the Lord for uh, the ruling that come down from the Supreme Court this week about the uh, the Liberty Church. That's my interest, man. I'm watching that. That's, I'm watching that quick, quite tighter and closer than anything. And uh, th that right to peaceably assemble. They can peaceably, right. and sometimes not so peaceably assemble uh, throughout this nation. We've got a right as the people of God to peaceably right. assemble. Right. Come in here, open up a book of the Word of God and tell you what it says and sing the songs together. And so keep your eye on that and be in much prayer about it. Be in prayer for our church. In the days ahead, as, as we grow uh, together, and, and God begins to move us forward in a, in, a, in a permanent place, but I thank God for this right now, and uh, where we're able to meet, and the liberty that we have here. John chapter 20, let's all stand, and I'm going to read a few verses from John, and we'll let you be seated, and we're going to go read one Old Testament passage in Isaiah, so Isaiah 53 will be... Uh, the Old Testament passage that we'll read from John chapter 20. Now let's just start reading in verse 11. These are familiar verses, and we'll read down to about verse 29 probably. Uh, let's start in John 20, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And when they say unto her, they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away the Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast hid him. I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. So she didn't recognize him as she looked upon him, but she knew that voice. Amen. Amen. My Amen. sheep know my voice. Amen. 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 And so let's, let's go a step further. Verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she, what she had seen the Lord, or that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them. He didn't need a doorknob. He didn't even need the door, praise God. <laughs> Boom, right through the doorway, amen. And the Bible says, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and the first words out of his mouth, as he stood in the midst of his disciples, he saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, again, peace be unto you. So he reiterates his message to them. Even or as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
Well, the Word of God just told us right there. They seen the print in his hand. They seen his side. And that's how they knew it was him. And now Thomas, who wasn't there, said, Unless I see the print and I see the wound in his side, I will not believe. Verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were with him. And Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. <laughs> there we go again. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, same message, peace be unto you. Now let's stop right there. It, we, we're going to read a couple more verses. But it would be understood right here that Jesus is emphasizing that his disciples, his people, his children should have peace. Three, three times now right. he's made this statement unto them after his resurrection and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, wonder who told Jesus that Thomas was dying. Right. Now watch. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. Now here was Thomas's answer. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have yet believed. Now, you go ahead and be seated. And as you're being seated, turn over to Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter number 53. A very, just a wonderful verse or a wonderful chapter. This is... The chapter. When you read Isaiah 53, it makes you wonder how the Jews missed it. I mean, because they knew Isaiah 53. They were taught Isaiah 53 uh, from, from children, from being children just in their, in their homes and in their synagogues. And so understanding this particular chapter of the Bible, one must wonder how they missed Calvary. Because this gives Calvary uh, down to a T in Jesus' life as well as Psalm 22. But watch this. Chapter number 53 of Isaiah. Look with me in verse 1, and then we're going to go back to John 20. Who hath believed thy report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now the Bible says here, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him, we despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. That's how we can have peace when he was saying, Peace be unto you, because he bore our griefs. Remember that. That's important to the message before us today. He hath borne our griefs. Do we know what grief is? Grief is hurting. Grief is pain. Grief is wounds. Grief is emotional pain. Grief is, yes. is, is just torment sometimes in your mind where you have suffered emotional and mental pain due to loss or affliction in life. Yes. And the Bible says He hath borne our griefs yes. and carried our sorrows. Yes. He's taken our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But watch this, verse 5. This is where we're going to. But he was wounded. Do you see that word there? The word that's being used. What did Thomas want to see? What did the disciples know that it was Jesus? They noticed that it was the wounds that were in his hands, the wounds that were in his sides, not the scars. It doesn't say scars. And then verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Here we go, here we go. Here's our text as we get into John chapter 20 in just a moment. And with his stripes, we, 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 you, yeah. me, yeah. you out there, you yeah. out there in podcast land, with his stripes, with his wounds, with his suffering, with what he endured and he faced, we are healed. Amen. We can be healed. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, I understand that just the awesome responsibility before 
before me this morning as we seek to preach this message. I, I realize who I'm preaching it to, and I realize the subject matter and the sensitivity of it. And I realize, Lord, what folks have gone through, not every situation individually, but God, I know that in this life, in this fallen world in which we live, that we go through it and we suffer wounds and we suffer uh, scars and we suffer afflictions and strifes. And God, I pray, Lord, that you might help your people here today, that we would leave here with victory, and we would leave here with a better understanding of those things that befall us as people and as Christians and children of God. And God, I pray that we would leave here today with, with a renewed sense of, of vigor and a renewed sense of life. And God, we would leave here with victory in our soul as the people of God. I pray that if there's any among us that does not know you, not saved, I pray, God, that you would save them this morning. Yeah. God, begin to work in their hearts that conviction, God, that yeah. is required first. And God, for the child of God, I ask that you would give them victory as we preach and deliver this message today. In Jesus' name, and for Jesus' sake we pray, amen and amen. You can go back to the book of John, chapter number 20, as we get our start. But as, as we open up here this morning, and as I show you what the Lord has given me and laid upon my heart for this week, and again, I understand the awesome responsibility that this is in dealing with this subject matter. It's something that, to be quite honest with you, I put away and I put away, and the Lord kept saying, no, this is the message for this Sunday morning. So as we get into this, I, I want to address a subject. So we're dealing with a subject today, and that being the case, we're going to do some Bible turning, and we're going to interweave, if you please, two individuals in Scripture, and maybe integrate Paul as well. But I'm going to take a portion of the life of the Apostle Peter, and I'm going to take what we see here in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of John in chapter number 20, and they are already interwoven by the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And I want to take them and interweave them to deal with our subject matter that we're going to address today. Now, throughout the Scriptures, when Jesus made the statement Himself, He, he said to be careful that you're not offended in Me. And He began to speak about when offenses come. And the fact of the matter is that, that most of us, all of us in the room are adults here today, and as you go through life and you go through childhood and then you transition into adulthood and then you get saved and when you get saved you begin to go to church and then when you go to church you begin to go through life in church here's what we find as the people of God as individuals is that a lot of times in life we suffer uh, maladies we suffer affliction we suffer heartaches we suffer things that have let us down we have had a hope in a person and that person let us down we've had hope in a situation and a situation let us down we've had hope in a church and, and an assembly and that group let us down and we've had friends that maybe have turned their back upon us and stabbed us in the back and let us down if you please and we as individuals as a group we go through this life and deal with and have emotional uh, setbacks and emotional issues where we face uh, the problems in this life as children of God and when we do so they give us wounds that we must learn how to deal with they give us emotional wounds that we must learn how to address and what good come out of them because to any one of us that's ever faced anything that was emotionally difficult the first thing we always ask is why why did that happen lord why did you let this happen how could you let this happen in our lives how could you let this happen to me why did this happen again and as i look around this room i love every one of you every single one of you and as I look around this room, this is a, a group of individuals that are now collected together. And those of you that are here together, there's been times where you face wounds in your life. You face problems and things that let you down. Some of you said, I'll never join a church again. I'll never go to a church again. Some of you are out there listening by podcast and by Facebook Live that said, I, I'm watching it, but I don't know if I want to be a part of church again because of something that happened in my past or someone that's let me down or something that I had a hoping that 
fail or some people that I put a lot of confidence and stock and faith in that I, I have hope in and it began to let me down. Well, what folks are saying when that happens in their lives, folks, is I have suffered a wound that I don't know how to deal with. I have suffered a wound to my heart, to my emotions, to my hopes, to a dream that I had that I can't quite put my hands around and know how to move forward. And I, I might put on a smiling face and I might say that it's okay, but sometimes something will be said or something will be triggered or something will pop up and in the recesses of my mind, what took place comes back to me and haunted me. And what I thought was buried comes back and I'm still addressing and I'm still having to deal with these emotions again. And you thought they were long healed and you thought they were long buried, but all it takes is something to trigger it and that emotion comes rushing back and the anger comes rushing back and the hurt comes rushing back and, and the loneliness and all that you face comes rushing back. And you know what? Maybe that wound was not healed after all. That's right. That's right. I want to go to the Word of God this morning. And boy, the Lord's helping me already in this message. And I want to deal with your heart. I want to go to your heart and your emotions and, and, and the Spirit of God within you to try to help you today. And as we look in John chapter number 20, Jesus Christ is now back from the dead. Jesus Christ has now risen. He has now come from the tomb. He has defeated death, hell, and the grave. Amen. Jesus Christ now has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He's went down into the heart of the earth, and he's got to those that were captive from being captive. He's taken the eternal blood, and he's put it on the eternal mercy seat. He's moved paradise from the heart of the earth, and he's now put it up into the abode of God in heaven. And now Jesus Christ walks into the room, no door needed, and all of a sudden stands in the midst of his disciples, and the first proclamation out of his mouth, the second proclamation out of his mouth, and then we see a third time he proceeds with his mouth to his disciples, peace be unto you. And I tell you, he does not intend on us to walk around let down, grieved and hurt with wounds from the past of our lives and what we face. The first words out of his mouth when he walked into a bunch of disciples that had been let down when they looked at the cross was peace be unto you. I want you to have peace. I want you to serve in peace. I've got a great job for you to do. I've got a great duty for you to do. There's multitudes that will need to be saved as a result of your ministry as disciples, and you're not going to be able to do it with flesh wounds bleeding from you. You've got to have peace within you to move forward to serve me in the days ahead. And that's why this is the second message preached at Bethany Baptist Church is because if we're going to move forward and we're going to be disciples to those that need to be saved and we're going to help those that are in a mess and we're going to show those that have been let down by church and let down by preachers and let down by infighting that this is going to be something different that we've got to have peace in our hearts and healing in our hearts and we've got to be in the place where we're over it so we can move forward for God and get somebody else move forward. Some of you got family members close to your heart, whether it's daughters and sons, whether it's whether it's loved ones, whether it's parents that don't want anything to do with another church. Yeah. That's right. Amen. God, no, I'm just gonna preach where we live. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Want anything to do with another church? You might have parents don't want anything to do with another church. Oh, there's another church. You know what that is? That's a wound that hadn't been healed. Right. And the only way you can help them is understanding your wound and what can be done about it. Amen. So as we go to John chapter number 20, we see that Jesus Christ, upon His first appearance to His disciples, His first appearance to His disciples, He's got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Amen. But He don't show them the keys. No. When Jesus Christ comes back, ladies and gentlemen, to His disciples, He didn't come with an angelic pose announcing this is Jesus that was just hanging on the cross three days ago and now here he is in front of you standing again. 
Yeah. When Jesus Christ came before his disciples, he didn't come with any fanfare. He didn't come with, with even the blood as proof of who he was. He came back showing his disciples. Yeah. And then the next day showing doubting Thomas who he was yeah. by the wounds in his hand yeah. and the wounds in his side. He identified, ladies and gentlemen, with them who he was by demonstrating to them not the deeds of death and on the grave, not the blood that he had applied on the mercy seat, but the wounds that he faced at the hands of his friends. With the wounds that he faced at the hands of the Jews. With the wounds that he faced at those that he come to minister to. Yeah. With the wounds that he faced at the hands that he said, I would have gathered you in as a hen gathered a broom. Uh, those that he looked out upon and the Bible said Jesus swear. Can I tell you, if anybody's ever been let down by their friends, if anybody's ever been let down by those that he has is, he is put in the forefront, if anybody's ever been let down by a group of people that he cared it's Jesus Christ that's standing before the disciples and he said, I'm not showing you the Jesus of death out in the grave. And I'm not showing you the blood. I'm showing you the wounds that are representative of me being hurt and afflicted and let down by those that I love. Identify themselves with wounds. I'm preaching this morning on that one word subject, wounds. I'm preaching today, ladies and gentlemen, on wounds. What wounds are about? Why are they come into our lives? What we're going to do about them? How we're going to move forward with them? How we're going to move forward in seeing the healing of them so that we can accomplish something for Jesus Christ? Quickly, I want to refer to a couple of verses. Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse 5, we've already read it. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. Right. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Remember what he told the disciples, peace be unto you. But here is how Isaiah 53, 5 closes. It opens with the fact that he was wounded for our transgressions, but it closes with the statement, and with his stripes we are healed. Yeah. With what he faced, with the wounds that he had, we can be healed. So yes, there can be victory. Yes, that don't have to bother you anymore. Yes, that old junk from the past don't have to come flooding back with one word spoken or seeing somebody in the store. Man, you can get victory over that thing today and was forward for God and accomplish something for Him in the days you've got left. Because He wants peace unto you, peace unto me, and with His stripes, with His wounds, we are healed. And we can be healed. First of all, today, as we get into this message, I'm going to talk about the causes of wounds. What do you mean, preacher? I want to talk about what causes wounds to happen. How wounds are afflict us. How do they take place in our lives? And I want to deal with it biblically. And again, I want to interweave two people here, and we're going to we're going to bring Paul into it for just a brief moment. But I want to interweave Peter. I want to interview Jesus in this message today and talk about wounds and how they happen, first of all, the causes of them. So look with me, if you would, in the book of Luke in chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22. What causes wounds, preacher? Well, first of all, carelessness can cause wounds. What, what do you mean? Well, sometimes anybody here got a scar from something that happened physically physically speaking, happened to you physically because you were careless? I mean, you just, you, you didn't, you, you forgot that you had that hot, water, hot pot of water on the stove, or you forgot that the stove was hot. Something happened that you were careless, and because of that, you've got a scar that you live with today because of carelessness. I mean, maybe you were told not to jump that ramp. Maybe you were told not to jump that creek. Maybe you were told not to do something, but in your carelessness, you went about and did it anyway. Well, scars emotionally come to us oftentimes with carelessness of others or carelessness in our own lives. Yeah. And I want you, if you would, to go to Luke chapter 22. 
excuse me, and let's pick up our reading here in about verse number, uh, let's, let's, let's look here in verse 30, let's start with verse 29, Luke 22 and 39, and I appoint you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now watch this. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, he turns now to Peter. Now we're all familiar with Peter's story, right? We're all familiar with what Peter did, denying the Lord three times, and I'm, I'm integrating that into our subject here today. So Jesus turns to Peter, over all the other disciples, James is there, John's there, Thomas is there, Bartholomew's there, and Judas, and all the disciples are there. And Jesus specifically turns to Peter, verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, the whole Satan had desired that he may sift you, or to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, any of you, you in here, grains, or maybe you have a grain that knows what a sifter is. You know that sifter that, that you got to look at me like a, like a cow looking at a new day. And, and that sifter that sift out all the junk and they sift that flour and they sift the wheat or whatever they were preparing to cook. And, and that's what the, Jesus is telling Peter. He said, look, Satan wants you and he's wanting to sift you. Satan, ladies and gentlemen, has come to kill and steal and destroy. Yeah. Satan, ladies and gentlemen, is coming that, that not that we might have life, but that he might take life from us, from us and that he might take victory from us. And what Satan wants to do, he wants to keep you out of the church. He wants to keep you out of victory. Satan loves it when God's people get wounded and they cross their arms and they say, I ain't going back to no church. I ain't being a part of another church. All they do is fuss and all they do is fight. All they do is argue. They can't get along over anything. Don't you know how many hypocrites are acting? That's what Satan wants, ladies and gentlemen, is you to be wounded by that issue and you to never have all the victory that you can have collectively in a church house serving God together that place right into his hands. Now, I know we don't want to admit that because we have nursed that thing so long. You know, we can nurse a wound. Amen. 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 Yeah. We can nurse hurt feelings. We can nurse emotional hurts that come our way so long that they just build up and they become our baby that we're nursing. And it's playing right in the Satan's hands to prevent you from being a part of a church where you can serve God Amen. and you can see life change and, and be in a situation where there's not a lot of fuss and fight and argument. Satan, that, that's what he's out to do is to kill and steal. He can't get your soul anymore, so he wants to wreck your life emotionally and spiritually so you'll never be all you can be for God. I ain't got that's the first verse. Now watch. He said, Satan had desired to have you that he may have sent you as wheat. Now, what we're getting ready to talk about with Peter, Jesus gave him fair warning about this. Right here in verse 31. He said, Peter, Satan is coming after you. That's Satan right. wants you. Why would Satan want Peter? Anybody got any ideas why Satan would want Peter out of the way? Because it would be Peter, ladies and gentlemen, that would preach on the day of Pentecost and see those thousands saved. It's Peter that would kind of be the stalwart of the early church along with James and John. But Peter was the spokesman until Paul came along. It was Peter that God used to lay the foundation. Right. And don't you know that Satan knew the potential that Peter had to be a damage to the cause of hell right. and be a victor for the cause of Christ. And because of that, Satan was ready everything he could do against Peter. Yeah. to prevent him from being all that God wanted him to do. And so above all, Jesus turns to Peter and he said, Satan wants you, Peter. Right. And the reason Satan wanted him is because of what God wanted to do for Peter. Yeah, right. And listen to me. Satan has a target on you. He'll have a target on me. He'll have a target on this church because he knows what God wants to do through you through me and through this church. That's good. And carelessness prevents the, or carelessness calls Peter to suffer the wound that he's about to suffer. How do you know? Jesus gives him warning right here. 
Yes, it did. Now stay busy. He says here in verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may, he may send you his wheat. But I have prayed for thee, thank God for that, Amen. that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You see that? I've got a job for you, Peter. Now stay with me, verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both in the prison and the death. Now watch this. Jesus has given him more. <laughs> Verse 34, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt Christ deny that thou knowest me. So right there, Jesus gives Peter warning of what he's about to do and what Satan wants to do. Now listen, what does, what does Peter wind up doing? We all know what Peter winds up doing. Peter winds up doing exactly what Jesus warned him that he would do. He denied him before the cock crow three times. Peter denied him. Yes, so the wound that Peter is about to suffer in his life, spiritually speaking and emotionally speaking, happens as a result of his own carelessness at the warning that Jesus Christ gave to him. So a lot of times, wounds come to us out of our own carelessness, out of our own times where we don't heed the warnings and we don't heed the call of the Holy Spirit and we don't heed the nudge of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what happened in Peter's life. Jesus is telling him, you're going to do this. Watch out, Peter. Peter said, not me. Not me, praise God. Not me. I told somebody the other week, you always got to be careful that honey because there's a singer on the other end. Amen. And that was Peter. Peter was always the one. And everybody else might deny you. I ain't going to deny you much, God. I'm going to be right there with you. I'll be there 100% of the way, Jesus. Guess who the one denied it was? Peter, because he got careless in what Jesus was warning him against. So carelessness causes wounds. Number two, callousness of others. Here's where I want to go to Paul. Go with me. This is all in us. We'll get quickly into the message in just a moment. But the callousness is bugs. What do you mean? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Sometimes wounds occur in our lives not because of our carelessness, but because of the hard-heartedness or the callousness of other people. Come on now, let's, let's be honest. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians, I said 5. I'm going to verse 5. 2 Corinthians 2, 5. 2 Corinthians 2, 5. So not only carelessness is a cause of wounds, but callousness on the part of others. What do you mean? You know, sometimes people just don't have the heart that you've got. Amen? Some, sometimes people's heart ain't as soft as your heart. Sometimes people just don't care like you care. Sometimes people could be a devil plant in your life that you put confidence in them, Knowing good and well, they don't care like you care, and they're going to wind up hurting you and letting you down. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And because of that, it causes an emotional wound and an emotional affliction upon you that you've got to learn what that's all about and how to deal with it and get over it today. Now, we see this in the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul suffered like nobody other than Jesus. I'm telling you, Paul went through everything imaginable. Now, 2 Corinthians is a book, quickly, quickly, that's much different than 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was a book of rebuke. Paul had just planted that church, and they were kind of going astray, and man, he's letting them have it. But what happens in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is a group began to come into that church, and they began to pull, uh, pull away, pull the people away from Paul. And they began to kind of undercut Paul. And they began to kind of stab Paul in the back a little bit. That, that's what's taking place in 2 Corinthians. You know how people will pull on you. Amen. You know how people will pull on you. And, and you know, are you sure about that? Are you sure about this situation? Are you sure? And so what began to take place in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is groups of folks would come in and they were trying to cause divisions within the church at Corinth. Paul had given his life to them at this particular point. And so they began to question his apostleship. They began to question his credentials. They began to question his, his spirituality. They began to question his call. Why? Because one of the requirements
requirements of an apostle was to have seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So that seemed like that would be an open place to question Paul. Because Paul didn't get saved to Acts chapter number 9 after the resurrected Christ had already ascended up into heaven in Acts chapter number 1. So you know what the devils did with that? They said there ain't no way Paul could have seen the resurrected Christ. He, you know, he ain't no way he could be an apostle because he didn't see him. Jesus would already ascended in Acts chapter 1. Paul didn't get saved to Acts chapter 9 on the Damascus Road. But guess what happened on Acts chapter 9 on the Damascus Road? Paul, ladies and gentlemen, saw the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and was then blinded thereafter and God never gave him his sight fully back. But what he did see that day was the resurrected Jesus Christ when he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And on that day, Saul, ladies and gentlemen, became Paul of the apostle at his conversion, having witnessed the resurrected Christ. And when he goes on later, he said, I'm an apostle more than every one of you because I got called up to the third heavens and laid my eyes on me, praise God. Yeah. 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 However, we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 5 and he's going through this. He's going through this callousness. And so 2 Corinthians is really known as the autobiography of Paul because that's when he begins to pour his heart out to these people about the hurt and the suffering that he's going through, not just physically, but emotionally. Number one, because their question is apostleship, but the others that laid it down. So look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Now that's a preacher right there for you. Paul saying, I've been grieved more than all of you, but I'm not going to take it out on you. I'm still going to love you. And he says in verse 6, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of me, so that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He's talking about someone that's wronged him and wronged the church. Paul said, you need to forgive him. Don't let it rest on you. Let what he did rest on him. You don't need to walk around with that unforgiveness in your heart. Amen. I'm going to preach. I told you I was going to preach now. Watch. <laughs> For to this end also did I write. Here's why I'm writing the letter Paul said. Because I know what's going on in Corinth and I don't want y'all to be swallowed up in all that unforgiving junk that you're carrying around with you. He said here, verse 9, For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Now watch, verse 11. Lest who? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What is the context of the devices of Satan? It ain't booze, it ain't whiskey, it ain't drugs, it ain't meth, it ain't men, it ain't women, it's not pornography. Yes, all It is unforgiveness in the heart of a Christian that are the devices of Satan that Paul is saying, not letting gain advantage of us. Amen. 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 Praise God. Let me get down here. He's, look at it. Verse 11, verse 10. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, for forgave I it in the person. He said, he's hurt me more than he's hurt y'all. But for your sakes, I'm forgiving him. Amen. So you don't see your preacher walking around with a bunch of unforgiving spirit in your heart. Amen. 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 He said, so for your sakes, I'm forgiving him. And verse 11, lest. That means if we don't forgive, Satan should get to an advantage of us. So Satan gets the toehold. Satan gets the foothold. Satan gets the advantage. Satan pitches to the mat. Satan's winning the boxing match. Satan's winning the ball game. He has got the advantage over us when we do not forgive those that have hurt us. Now you can't help their forgiveness. You can't help their actions. But you can help you carrying that junk around the rest of your lives. Amen. Now watch this. 
For we are not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, man, let me just take y'all a step further since you talk about being let down by people. Watch what he said. When I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened unto me of the Lord, verse 13, he said, remember Paul, Paul would travel with other preachers. Paul would travel with other preacher companions, and they would go in and they would storm a city for Jesus Christ, see people win, and along the way, he would have people that would let him down, stab him in the back, get jealous of him, because he was preaching and winning people, and here's what he says. He says in verse 12, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. So he was beginning to look around for Titus, and Titus is not there by his side. And Paul said, I'm beginning to feel let down because Titus is not with me. But notice semicolon colon here, based on what I just said, but taking my leave of them, I went from this into Macedonia. He said, I looked around, I didn't see Titus nowhere with me, but guess what? I went forward for God anyway. I went into Macedonia anyway. I preached the gospel anyway. I come back to another church. Satan 
said, John serving you, God, because you've been so good to him. Okay? You see, he's been searching up and down throughout, throughout the earth. And God said, oh no. He said, you can do anything you want to with him. You just can't take his life. Now here's what we must understand as children of God. These wounds, these things that have befallen us and come our way, number one, were either ordained of God or at the very minimum allow of God. Right. Amen. you got to understand that. If you don't understand that, you're going to have a hard time going through not just life as a Christian, life in general. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They were either one, ordained of God, like in Job's situation. God said, Satan, have at it. You just can't take his life. Or at the very minimum, allow it, God. Because God allowed it by taking down that hedge that had been around Job. Now, that being the case, number two, or three, or five, or whatever I'm on, not only the cause of wounds, let's get into the characteristics of wounds. All of that, ladies and gentlemen, was our lengthy introduction for about four quick points on characteristics of wounds. Number one, number one, go with me to John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20, listen to me. Stay with me, John 20, which we're going to... Get into what this is all about, these wounds in the life of a child of God. First of all, church, they serve as a testimony of who we are. What do you mean? John chapter number 20, look in verse number 20. John 20 and verse number 20. And we're going to look in 25, down to 28. Now watch this. John chapter number 20, verse 20. And when he had said, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Drop down here to verse number 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus to the, the doors, being shut, and stood in the midst of them, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach into the finger, and behold my hands, and reach into thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless. Do you see that right there? But believe it. And Thomas answered. Here was Thomas's response to Jesus identifying himself through his wounds. He says, my Lord and my God. Number one, church, these wounds will serve as a testimony and a statement and an identifier of who you are. They can serve, ladies and gentlemen, to identify to others. Not only that, is yes, I've been hurt, but I'm Just pounds of flesh 
being nailed to a cross. And so the last time they saw Him, what He looked like was just bloodied, beaten up, bruised flesh hanging on a cross. That was the last picture in their minds of Jesus Christ. In other words, that was how they were identifying Him until today. Until John 20. And when He walks in that room, praise God Almighty. He walks in and He don't even need a doorknob and He don't even need a door. He just rolls up in there. And when He rolls up in there, He don't look like He looked the last time they seen Him. He don't look like He looked on that cross. All He's got now are these wounds that He's identifying Himself with. And He's not identified with what He was there. He's just identified with the wounds that He's carried around. And what they're testifying of is I He'd go in and out like the disciples. 
He was right there with the disciples. He was going in and out, serving with them. He was doing miracles along the way, but he wasn't walking through no doors. But along with showing his wound that day, instead of using a doorknob or throwing back the curtain or however the door was hinged or working, he just walked through the thing. In other words, he manifested power on that day when he showed his wounds yeah. that had already been there all along. He's just showing it that day. Yeah. Come here, how's this happen? Here's the trophy of your wound. What the wounds will do for you is, Brother Kevin, they will manifest power within you that was there all along. But now here you are on this day manifesting power that you've all of a sudden tapped into. What do you mean? Come here. When you got saved by the grace of God, so many things happened to you that day, you don't even have a clue of all that happened to you that day. But one of the greatest things that happened to you that day was you got indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus Christ said, I send another comforter unto you. And that day that Bible said, hath given us all things that pertaineth to life and godliness. But that day you got saved, you didn't know all that you got when you got saved. All you knew that you was just a stumbling around baby. You got up and I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to read my Bible? Am I supposed to? And you're just laughing like everybody else is acting and looking like everybody else is looking and just watching people and trying to figure it out. How, how you were going to be as a Christian. You didn't know. You didn't know all that stuff that was on the inside of you until a wound come your way and a fight come your way and a battle come your way and a situation come your way. And the next thing you know, all you knew was I'm hurt and I'm crying and I'm defeated, but I can't quit. I can't give up. Jerry, I'm going to keep going. 
going to keep going. Am I going to quit on God? Or am I going to keep going? Keep going. You know what tells you to keep going? That power that's been there all along. Amen. But you didn't know was there really. Amen. Until I had to be used. Yeah. 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 That's what we must do for you. Yes. The trophy of a woman. Remember it was from prison where Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. Yes. The triumph after the woman. Watch this. John 21. John 21. Back home, not here. I mean, Peter. I love him. I do. I used to pick on him all the time before I figured out I was probably like him. Oh, not here, Peter. Remember what Jesus told me at the start of this message? Satan had desire to have you to sift you as well. Oh, not me, not me, not me, not me. John chapter 21, Jesus has already addressed Thomas, that Thomas. Now he's got a specific appointment to keep. So he's one that ain't that, that ain't around. He's one that's kind of all on his own. He's one that's failing pretty bad. Let him down pretty good. It's been public. I mean, he publicly failed. Come on now. He publicly let him down. He publicly said, I know not the man. And he started cussing. Yes. And he's won publicly. We would say he would be the most wounded of all of us. Because see, Peter was a different sort. John, you know, was just hard charging. He was like Paul. He was just, just that rough, rough exterior. Peter was a little more wet down. Peter failed him that day and he was completely defeated. John chapter 21, Jesus goes to the most wounded of his disciples. Let's see if we could go to verse number 15. We know the story up to verse 15. Peter said, I go fishing. John followed him. Verse number 15, so when they had died, let's start here in verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he turned his fish and spoke unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. The other disciple came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with the fishes. Soon then, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid there on the bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Bring up the fish which you have now caught. I'm so glad Jesus had a personality. He knew good and well they caught nothing. He just, he just had a good personality. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes. Now Jesus let him draw the net. And 150 and 3, and for all there, we got, we got some, we, there's something to that. I'll teach it to you sometime. For all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus said unto them, Come and die. None of the disciples first asked, Who art thou? And no one that it was the Lord. Jesus then comes and taketh bread and giveth them fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Of all the disciples, he had one that he had to go to. The one that was the most wounded. The one that publicly laid him down. Publicly failed him. He said, Simon, son of John, as lovest thou me more than these? He said unto me, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of John, as lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, Simon, son of John, as lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. The triumph unto the woman. What do you mean? Here's, here's the thing about women. They will have a tenderizing effect on your heart. Yes, yes. They do. But we gotta admit that. All right. Y'all see me when y'all see me when I about 26, man? And now it's a it's a whole different person. Why? Because wounds have a tenderizing effect on your heart. Yeah. On your personality. Wounds teach empathy towards others. Wounds, ladies and gentlemen, 
teach you a little bit about a softening process that took place in you when somebody else goes through that same fight and suffers some of those same wounds, you can identify with that better and empathize with them better. Amen. Amen. And wounds will take you to a place of ministry that you might not have been able to go to otherwise had it not been for the affliction of the wound. So as we look back over our lives and who God allows to come into our paths through our lives, isn't it funny that it's always folks that we can say, oh, you too? You went through that too? You faced it too? You've been through something too? You know when a friend is joined when you can say, oh, you too? And you can understand that I wasn't the only one that hurt. And I wasn't the only one that went through that. But because I did, I can now empathize and minister to this person on a different level yeah. than what I did prior to going through that. Because Jesus shows the example. He's got all the disciples, and because He's got all the disciples, He's showing them something to Peter. And He goes to Peter and He says, Simon, son of John, this loves thou me more than these. Yeah, he will. Yeah. By the third time Jesus looks him in his face, Simon begins to weep bitterly. Simon begins to weep, and his heart softened and broke because three times he denied Jesus. And I know I've shown you this before, but I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. Wounds will teach you some things as you move forward. They don't only make you more empathetic. They make you a little bit wiser. Second Peter chapter 2. I've shown you this before on Sunday morning. For a lot of you that, that, that have heard me before. You know, there's something about touching that hot stove and you get a scar. That scar says, don't touch that again. Right? 2 Peter 2 1, but there were false prophets also among you. Who? Who? 2 what? 2 1. 2 what? What book are we in? Peter. Who's writing this? Peter. Who preached on the day of Pentecost? Peter. Who's penning this book under inspiration? Holy Peter. Hmm. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Look. Even denying the Lord that bought me. You think Peter knows a little bit about denying the Lord? You think Peter knows a little bit about being able to instruct others on being careful now concerning denying the Lord? You think Peter learned a little bit about the steps that took place in his heart, in his mind, in his spirit that led him to denying the Lord? And now Peter can look to other people and say, hey, they're getting ready to deny the Lord. Be careful. You're getting ready to deny the Lord. Be careful. I see the steps you're starting to take and make. Be careful. These wounds allow you to have a little foresight to be able to minister to other people ahead of time that they might not fall into the same wound and track you for them. Amen. Finally, I want you to go one more place with me. We're closing Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Teaching of a woman, man. Isaiah 30. The book of Isaiah. Chapter number 30. I want you to look at verse number 26. Isaiah 30, verse 26. Only one verse. We'll start here in verse 25. Let's give you this context. 25, 26. There shall be upon every high mountain, upon every high hill, rivers and streams of water in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Isaiah 30, 26. Watch this. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. He said, I'll bring light into your darkness. And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. That's seven times. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion. Yeah. 
as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, look and healeth the stroke of their wound. He said right there, I can bring light into your darkness. And he said right there, I can be, bring more brightness into your days. And ain't that what we all want? Yeah. Don't we want light in our dark times? And don't we want our days to be brighter? As he it brings, brings up healing to the strokes of our wounds. He said, that's what I can do for you. That's what I want to do for you. But don't look at your wounds as a mark of defeat. And don't look at your wounds as a mark of where throughout life you are you are at a place where you're incapacitated or a place where you're not what you used to be or what you once was. Look at your wound to the degree that I have done this, I have failed, I've let this happen, this has happened, and I'm not going to be that anymore and I'm moving forward for God. It's occurred. I don't know why God allowed it to occur. But no more can I carry this around tonight. I've got to give it to Jesus yes. and let Him heal it so that I might be all that I can be for Him. And you know who it was that preached on the day of the house? That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we learn through our wounds. They say, I, I was hurt, but I'm not hurt. I was skin up pretty good, but God's kept me. I was let down, but here I am. Satan had desired to sit you as weak, but I have prayed for me, Peter. One last note. You prayed for Peter before he ever failed. He did. Before he ever failed, he, did. he was praying for Our Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. I love the servants, Lord. I love these people. I thank you for it. God, I pray that you might bless this message. God, certainly those folks here suffer wounds emotionally, spiritually. God, I pray that you might go and bring lightness to their darkness and bring their days brighter than they've ever been. And I pray, God, that you would heal them God, let them testify that I'm not there anymore. I'm not at that place anymore. And God, let you work in their lives as a church collectively. May you bless our people. May you grow us spiritually. May you grow us into mature Christians. And then God, in turn, grow us numerically. God, we desire to grow spiritually before we desire anything. I pray, God, that you would save the laws and work in the hearts and the lives of people. God, we thank you for everything said and done, every dollar given, every, everybody that's watched through YouTube, every prayer that's been prayed, everything that's taken place. We thank you and we give it back to you. God, I praise your name for how good you've been to us. Help us, God, to, to see you this week and see through our wounds this week and move forward for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, we pray. Let's all stand and close with the song. Uh, Let's close with the old rugged cross. Let's close with the old rugged cross.
each one of you come with another good number today. Be prayerful. Bethany Baptist Church as we move forward in the days ahead. And uh, God is doing our work. I'm telling you, God is going to do what He has put in our hearts to do. And so let's be prayerful about it. I hope you have a good week. Be safe. Listen to the podcast. I'll do some live streams uh, as, as we move ahead. And uh, just have a good week. I love each one of you. And I pray that God be with you this week and watch over you. Amen. Love you. This is in prayer for you. I have a father, Lord. We thank you. We love you. We yes. It's so gracious of you, Lord, to give us this opportunity to gather together again. And, and your worship is lift up your name and hear your word. Lord, thank you and go with us and guide us and direct us. Keep us safe and bring us back to the next appointed hour, Lord. And dismiss us with your love and your care and your mercy. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. I love y'all. Be careful going home. I'll see you.